someone in your community who's lost and they're going to be separated from God for all eternity. Do you have a heart for the lost this morning? Do you have a heart for the lost every day? You see, because it impacts all of us. Oh, we have a heart for our jobs. We have a heart for soccer, for baseball, for football, for basketball. We have a heart for a lot of different things. And we'll teach our kids or our neighbor's kids or whatever it may be, whatever sport it may be, but we never mention to them about the love of Jesus Christ. Do you have a heart for the lost this morning? J. Warner Wallace, a former cold case detective and former atheist who investigated the Bible claims of Christ and is now a Christian, teaches others how to answer others' questions logically and reasonably. He states in his book, In Forensic, Forensic Faith, most teenagers are in, in, uh, articulate about the religious, their religious beliefs. In fact, the majority cannot defend what they believe. 63% of teenage Christians do not believe Jesus is God's son. That's kind of a contradiction, isn't it? 51% do not believe Jesus rose from the dead. 68% don't believe the Holy Spirit is a real person. Only 33% of young Christians who are church said church will play a part in their lives when they leave home. If the current trend related to this belief system and practices of young people continue, church attendance is going to decline 50% in the next decade. College professors are nearly five times more likely to be professing, professing atheists or agnostics than people in the general public. They reject the Bible as the actual word of God. When surveyed the last segment, uh, the largest segment of young ex-Christian respondents said they left Christianity because they had intellectual doubt, skepticism, and unanswered questions. In other words, in a world which has questions, Christians are found stuttering. You see, when your kids or your grandkids, when your friend or whoever it may be that you're playing with has questions or, or you're around. And they ask questions about the world and they ask questions about God and they ask questions about Jesus Christ because they're lost and they're searching. Are you found stuttering? You see, it's a serious issue. Oh, we take a lot of things serious, folks. We take everything that I mentioned before serious. You say, oh, well, Chris, you know what? I can't do that at work because, you know, my work won't let me. Okay. But you have an hour for lunch that you can answer those questions. You've got a little bit after work maybe to answer those questions. You see, what's important to us? Oh, we think all of this material stuff and all this stuff that we give to our kids and everything is important. But the most important gift that you can give your kids or any of your neighbors or anybody that you know is lost is the gift of Jesus Christ. We just don't want to do it. No, we're not going to do it. I'm afraid to. I don't have time to. It's not important to me is what we're telling the Lord. It's not important to me to tell that person in the grocery store line about Jesus Christ. I don't have time. I got to get home. You see, folks, it's going to trickle down not only to our kids, but our grandkids and our great-grandkids. What are you doing about it? You see, they're the most important. 
Oh, it's easy to come into church every Sunday morning and praise God and come within these walls and hug each other and fellowship with each other. What's hard is going out into this dark world and telling people about Jesus Christ. You see, having a heart for the lost is of utmost importance. In fact, do you understand that we're commanded to witness? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus said, go make disciples. Teaching them all what I've taught you. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a command, folks. It's not something that we're supposed to say, oh, well, maybe I'm going to do it, or, oh, I get my maybe, I don't know. It's a command. From the biggest boss that we have, that's God, the living God. It's not an option. But we treat it as an option. We don't really care when it comes down to it. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. One of the biggest things that I think will be one of the worst things is if you're a Christian, you die, Jesus takes you before the Father and he just stands there. Dead silent. Yeah, Father, he, you know, they're mine. But they didn't confess me before men. I'm not going to confess them before you. Yes, they're mine, but you know what? They didn't want to tell anybody about you. Paul tells us in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of salvation. If we know the power of salvation in our lives, we shouldn't be ashamed of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, there's people out there wondering, why haven't they talked to me? Why haven't he talked to me? Why hasn't she talked to me? Why, why hasn't mom and dad talked to me? Why hasn't grandma and grandpa answered my questions? This morning I want us to examine a man who knew how to answer another's questions. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. One of my favorite ones. We're going to examine this man's courage, his boldness, his dedication, and the way he responded to people where they're at. Because he did, it, did this, he made a difference in advancing the kingdom of God. And he shows us qualities which we need to have in our lives. If we truly care about those around us who are lost and have questions about the faith. Look in Acts chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 25 through 40. If you remember right, the church was enjoying their newfound faith in this holy city. They were rejoicing because the church was growing. They were witnessing miracles. Yet there was opposition, there was the stoning of Stephen, Saul trying to make a name for himself was persecuting the church. He was throwing people in jail because they were following the way. And because of Paul's persecution, the church scattered. And it was because that, that was the promise that Jesus made them out of Acts 1.8. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and the remotest part of the world. That's what's happening in this Acts passage. Is you're seeing that, you know what, everybody got comfortable. They wanted just to come together and they just wanted to fellowship and they didn't really want to spread the word of Jesus Christ anywhere. They just wanted to come together. They didn't want to get out of their comfort zone. But you see, the church was forced from that zone. And they went out sowing the seeds of the gospel. And this is where we run into Philip the Evangelist, a man God used powerfully. Look with me in these verses. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel 
to many villages of the Samaritans. Who were they? That was Philip, John, and Peter, the apostles that were there. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and three, there were, was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. There was an Ethiopian finance guy, to put it in today's terms, who was leaving Jerusalem. He had went there to worship the Lord. He couldn't get within the temple itself, but he was outside the temple, and he went down to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? Do you ever ask anybody that? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered, Philip and said, please tell me of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture. He preached Jesus to him. He started talking to him from that scripture about who Jesus is. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, and Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he come to Caesarea. Who's Philip? Philip's not the apostle Philip. There was an apostle Philip, but this man was described as an evangelist. He was the one in chapter 6 who waited on the tables. He was the one that was full of the Holy Spirit. He was a man full of wisdom. He was one in which he had surrendered his life to Jesus Christ fully. He understood what a servant's heart is all about. He understood that it wasn't about him, but it was about Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, who died for him. He was well respected in the community, and God used him because he was willing. He touches my heart because, you know what, I've been there. I've went up through the ranks of being a deacon. I've went up through the ranks of the church. I've served on a lot of different committees before God ever called me to preach. And I understand where he's at. He's excited. He's passionate. He wants people to understand who Jesus is. You see, but it shouldn't just be that way. It should be in all of us. I'm going to give you five truths of having a heart for the lost this morning. Five truths. Having a heart for the lost is having a relationship with the Lord. You see, Philip had a relationship with the Lord. We can go back to, to verse 5 in chapter 8. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. You know, you have to have a relationship with the Lord before you can ever proclaim Christ to someone. And because Christ has come into your life and you're proclaiming him to whoever it is, they ought to see that there's a change in your heart. They ought to be able to see that, you know what, he's pretty or she's pretty passionate about what she's talking about. She's different. He's different. He had a relationship with the Lord. He understood what it meant. He showed fruits 
in serving tables. We don't know when he gave his life to Christ, but he shared the message of Jesus Christ. At some point in time, he came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He trusted him in understanding that he died on the cross, that he was the Messiah, that he was the, Messiah, uh, the Savior, and that he died on the cross for his sins, that his blood was shed for sins. You see, sometimes we lose out on that aspect. And he understood that he was buried and raised again, and he overcame death for us so that we could live with him. At some point in time, Philip understood that. Maybe we need to understand it a little bit better, Christian. Maybe we need to understand that there was a life given for us and that we shouldn't be taking that very lightly. Because he died, we live. We need to have a strong relationship with the Lord. See, people know that our relationship's strong when we, they see fruits in our life. When they say, huh, you know what, they've got a great heart. They didn't even think anything about themselves about this. They're always helping. They're always coming over and, and telling me how much they love me and praying for me. I don't even know who this Christ is, but you know what? Man, they're, they're authentic. They're not trying to put on a mask. They're not trying to put on a show. Living holy lives, walking the call, walking, of being obedient. You see, we shouldn't be like Simon. If you go on and read 9 through 24 in chapter 8, Simon was this great big magician. We talked a little bit about him last week. And he wanted to trust Christ and he said that he believed in him, but you know what? His fruits never showed it. That's a lot of Christians these days. They want to trust in Christ and they want to come to church and they want to be involved in church, but once they get outside of church, you couldn't tell if they're a Christian or not. Secondly, having a heart for the lost is being obedient to God. Philip was obedient. He went to Samaria. Samaria was an outcast. It was where there were Jews and Gentiles who had married, and they were intermingled, and the Jews totally hated them. Let me ask you a question this morning. What if God told you to go someplace that you didn't want to go? To witness to a people that you didn't want to witness. What would be your heart? You see, because he may be telling you to go across the street to tell somebody about him. He may be telling you to go at work and talk to that one person who's always the burr under everybody's saddle. That everybody always talking about. He may be telling you to go down to the drunk on the corner and love on that boy or that lady and share the gospel with him. You willing to do it? Are you willing to be obedient to put everything that you want, everything that you desire, everything that is self? Are you willing to lay it at the throne of God and say, I'll go wherever you want me to. I don't care if I have to quit my job. I don't care what it costs me. I'm going. You see, that's called full surrender, full trust. God is in control. He is my God, and I'm going to serve him. See, look in verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem, okay? They were in the city, they spread the gospel, they laid their hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit so that God could um, allow people to understand that he was at work. Don't do that anymore. When you're receiving, the Holy Spirit comes in and you're sealed. And so what did they do? They started heading back to Jerusalem. 
and they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem. Here they went. They went out and they spread the gospel. They didn't just stop where they were at. Well, you know what? I got my one in today. I think I'll stop. Boy, I worked hard for the Lord today. You know what? I told one person that God loved him today. I think I'll take a vacation. That's not, that's not what Philip and them did. They continued on. And then an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. You see, he heard the angel say, hey, you know what? Let's leave this revival that's going on. I've got another mission for you. No, Lord, I want to stay here. You know, everybody's rejoicing. Everybody's singing how amazing God is. When he, we ought to be sitting there thinking, he's coming after me. And he's sending someone to do it. And he may be sending you to do it. You see, he was obedient. He didn't hesitate to leave that soul saving event he said okay lord wherever you want me to go don't really know there's nothing down there but i'm going to go and he listened to god's instruction but not only that look in verse 35 he said then philip opened his mouth and he began from this, this scripture he preached jesus to him he was obedient you see, when that guy asked the question, Philip was obedient and starting right where he was at. Can, can we do that? Can we start where somebody says, hey, I got a question in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. And you start looking at it. And can you relate that verse back to Jesus Christ and share the gospel with them? You see, that's what, Pete, uh, that's what um, Philip was doing. He was being obedient. Most of the time, like I said, now you need to go talk to my Sunday school teacher. You need to go talk to the pastor. You need to go talk to the discipleship leader. No. We need to be obedient. And we need to talk to them right where they're at. You see, we, walk, we need to walk through that open doors when it's presented. There's open doors presented in your lives each and every day by the Lord. Every day to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. You see, we're just too busy to see that door open. We've got all these other things on our mind. We're not listening to his voice, and then we're not being obedient to sit there and to talk with him. We need to partner with the Lord. We don't need to be afraid of the opposition. Like I said, it's eternal, folks. The outcome's eternal. Romans 10 says, how will they hear, how will they believe if they're not sent? Do you believe that you were sent out into this world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ as a Christian? I hope so. Because that's what we need to do. Jesus says this. You say, well, I love Jesus Chris. Oh, he's my Savior. But I'm not going to do that. Listen to what Jesus says. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. <laughs> you see, if we love Jesus, we'll obey his commandments and do the things that he wants us to do. That's if we love him. But you see, most of us want to say, well, I love you up to this point, Jesus, and then, you know what, I'm going to do it my way the rest of the time. No, I'm not going to go over there. You know why? Because I don't like those folks. I don't like the way they look. I don't like their skin color. I don't like their economic background. I don't like. And Jesus said, if you obey me, or if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. He saw none of that. He saw people in a dark world that were lost in which he wanted to be found. Look in verse 40. Philip found himself at uh, as, as a toast, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Look, 
He went from a soul-saving revival. He went down to talk to this Ethiopian, and he watched God bring him into the kingdom. And then what did he do? Well, that's two. I think I'll just quit. No. He went on, and he kept preaching Christ. He never gave up. He was always looking to preach Christ. Always. He was obedient because he believed in the one that died for him. Having a heart for the lost is being people of prayer. We already seen in verse 26. You see, it says, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, What? Get up. Did you see that? You see, they were sitting down. I think, I think Philip was praying. I think he was thanking God for everything that had been going on. I think him and Peter and John were sitting around just kind of figuring out what went on. And the angel said, get up. He, he heard him because he was sat down and he was silent just for a minute. How many of you are silent just for a minute out of a 24-hour day to let the Lord speak to you? To tell you, hey, you know what? Let me guide you over here to talk to someone. Let me tell you to pick that phone up and call someone. See, he heard the Holy Spirit in 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up to join this chariot. Why? Because he had prepared in prayer. Because he heard God speak through his angel. And then he heard God speak through the Holy Spirit. You see, boldness comes from prayer. You wonder where your strength comes from to witness to people and to sit down and talk to them. It comes from prayer. It comes from prayer. That's where your boldness comes from. You try to do it on your own, you'll fall flat on your face. See, we need to be people of prayer. Why? Number one, it allows us to commune with God. Number two, it allows us to see the selfishness in our heart and the being afraid to share the gospel with anybody. And then number three, it shows us whose God's heart is. God's heart's for lost people. That's his desire. And that's where our hearts ought to be. But the only way that we can do that is to be in prayer. The only way we can do that is to seek him out, to allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to ask God to allow us the opportunity to speak his gospel, to examine our own hearts through his spirit so that he can strengthen us for those spiritual battles. Do you understand that when you have an opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ, and there's that fear there. It's called spiritual warfare. There's a being called the devil that does not want you to do that. Why? Because he understands that that person may come to Christ. And when that person comes to Christ, he's lost him from this world. And, and, and he knows that. And he's going to do everything he can to keep you from sharing that gospel. That's what prayer's for. To understand God's heart. Prayer is not for God. It's for us. It's to change our hearts to what he wants. That's what prayer is for. Having a heart for the lost is knowing God's word. Look in verse 35 again. Then Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture and he preached Jesus to him. Philip knew the Old Testament, folks. That Old Testament passage is from Isaiah 53. It's about Jesus Christ, who is the sheep, who is the ultimate sacrifice, who didn't say anything as he was put on trial and as they put him on the cross. He was silent. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter because he understood what he needed to do. But you see, Philip knew that. That's more important. I want you to understand that Philip took him from that point all the way to Jesus' resurrection. 
He was the student of that Old Testament. We should be the student of the Old and the New Testament. We're students of a lot of different things. I've said this before. I'll say it again. We're students of works. See, I want to learn all I can about my works. Everything I can. There's nothing wrong with that. But if Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, we should be students of his word. So we can explain the scriptures to whoever it was. He knew the story. He knew the story of the sin. And he knew the story of God's solution. And he knew the story of redemption. As he talked with folks. We need to know how to explain Christ from Scripture. You say, Chris, I just don't even know how to do that. I've never done it. Nobody's ever taught me. Guess what? I don't care if you're seven, and I don't care if you're 85 or 90. It's never too late to learn. You say, well, I wouldn't even know how to start with my grandkids or my kids. Look at here. Three different books by Lee Strobel. The Case for the Creator. Sit down and read it with him. They're never too young. Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ for Kids and The Case for Faith. You want to know how to talk to people about it? Here's how you do it. If you really want to. I've read through a little bit of these books. And if I was an adult and I didn't know how to sit down and talk with people, I'd read this book right here. It's simple. Or if you want more of an adult version, you can get Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. Talks about how he investigated Christ, just like J. Warner Wallace, and all the questions he had, and why he came to Christ. And you can use that material to talk to your friend or whoever it may be. But let me tell you something, folks. If you don't teach your kids or your grandkids, somebody else is going to teach them. And who is going to teach them? The world's going to teach them. It's not, let me tell you something, it's not the school's responsibility to teach your kids. It's not the church's responsibility to teach your kids or your, even your grandkids. The responsibility lies within the parents and the Christian parents. And the Christian grandparents, I'm going to put us in there. Or y'all, I'm not one yet. <laughs> not that I know of, anyway. Okay. It's nobody else. There's no one else's responsibility to teach the kids but yours. Grandparents, you may be the only ones that have that opportunity. Do it. Oh, well, Chris, I know. You know what? They're going to be there. They Really? Do you know that? Well, you know, I've been a member of this church for... No, that doesn't cover them. It's an individual choice. How much do you love them? How much do you love the folks around you? I had one of the kids at church eight months ago ask me, get me some books so that I can grow in my Christian walk. It took me eight months and I finally found them. We're lights in a dark world. Jesus is the word. His word should be the lamp unto our feet. It should be written on our hearts to where we can talk to people and we can meet people right where they're at. Do you see where Philip Manning, right where he was at? He didn't go back here and explain all this other stuff. He met him right where he's at. Who was he talking to? He was talking about Jesus, the Messiah. That's who he was talking to. Let me tell you about him. There's a story of Andrew that J. Warner Wallace talked about in his Forensic Faith book. He said, my dad was a Southern Baptist preacher, and while I was growing up, I basically lived at the church. I knew all the Bible stories and was even baptized when I was eight. 
After graduating high school, I went to college to get a degree in mechanical engineering. One might think a degree like this would involve little or no discussion of whether or not God exists or if Jesus was a real person. But I encountered these and many more objections. I had a literature class where the professor gave a presentation on, my, on how Jesus was copied from other gods and how this explained away the mythology of Jesus. I had an electromagnetic course in which the professor viciously attacked the concept of intelligent design. I had a space technology class in which the professor vehemently argued for the existence of aliens but refuse to acknowledge the existence of God. These are just a few examples from the many interactions I had with my professors. Unfortunately, most of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are severely lacking in training. And when they encounter even the weakest arguments, they're not prepared. As a Christian in the college setting, you are being constantly challenged, constantly poked and prodded. It's easy to throw up your hands in the air, become convinced your faith is a lie, when you're being trampled every day by both professors and peers. All Christians, but especially ones in college, must know what they believe and why they believe it, if they had any hope of surviving with their faith intact. I think of college almost like an atheist ambush. The Christians are walking in totally unaware of the danger until it's too late and the damage has already been done. It goes back to his statistics. That's why I wanted to take the time to thank you, Andrew, thanking Mr. Wallace. When I entered college, I was struggling with many of the objections I encountered. Did you hear that? He was in church from eight years old. He was saved when he was eight years old. But when he went into college, he wasn't prepared for the questions and the comments that were there. Why is it? Because we didn't teach it to him. The parents didn't teach, ah, oh, it'll be all right. All you got to do is just believe. It's all right. Just, uh, you just trust. No, not with this generation anymore and the generations to come because they want answers to their questions. They want reasonable answers to their questions. They want logical answers to their questions. Just because Jesus said it doesn't go good with them. Just because you say, I believe it, and that's faith, doesn't go good with them. In fact, that's why they're leaving church at record numbers. I discovered your podcast and your careful research and the evidence approach was incredibly helpful. As a result, I actually exited college with my faith even stronger than when I began. I want to encourage you to keep up the good work. That's why we offer the classes that we do, folks. That's why we offer apologetics classes. That's why we offer classes to let you learn how to defend your faith or how you talk to people about Jesus Christ so that we can teach you. Yes, you know what? I love to teach that stuff. But it's hard to get people to come and do it. And it's hard to come because of all the other pleasures in the world. But you know what? We could care less about our kids or our grandkids. We don't want to take that time to do it. I don't need that stuff, Chris. <laughs> Except eternity is hanging in the balance, folks. For your neighbor, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your spouse. For your friends. Having a heart for the lost is putting our faith into action. See, when you read this story, this true event from 25 to 40, you see, Philip was a man of action. Oh, we're in an age of heroes and superhero movies and everything else. You see, Philip was a superhero. He was one of the main superheroes to me. Oh, Jesus is the superhero. He's the one that came and saved the world. But Philip is a superhero because he put his faith into action. He proclaimed Christ. He showed love to Samaria where everybody else was spitting on it. He stood strong and firm in opposition. He brought the gospel to one or many. He didn't care. He 
He was available to men searching for the truth. I was talking to someone yesterday, and he was talking about all the guys he knew that went to strip clubs and all this other stuff. And he said to me, I just I don't understand it. I said, it's because they're searching for the truth. They're trying to fill their hearts with something other than the truth. God said eternity in their heart. We have to tell them this. You see, Philip saw the need of Christ, not religion or skin color. But here's what I want you to understand, folks. If you look there, that Ethiopian in whom he watched God bring into the kingdom was one of the first Gentile converts that went back to his own country and spread the word of God to the remotest parts of the place, Acts 1.8 says. You don't know who you're talking to. Could be the next Billy Graham. Could be the next Greg Laurie. You just don't know. See, we need to put our prayer or our faith into action. Believe that we can see, succeed through prayer. Understand God's will to come to him through his word. We have opportunities to share and to respond to his calling. Faith is no good unless action is taken. Need to, be, need to meet people on the desert road of life. That's obedience to God. We meet them there. We need to take advantage of the time and we need to have a deep relationship with them. Many years ago in St. Louis, a lawyer visited a Christian to transact some business. Before the two parted, his client said to him, I have often wanted to ask you a question, but have been afraid to do so. What do you want to know, the lawyer said. The man replied, I have wondered why you're not a Christian. Bold. You've done some transactions with people. You know some people. Have you ever just come out and asked them? Hey, can I ask you a question? Why aren't you a Christian? The man hung his head. He said, I know enough about the Bible to realize that it says a drunkard cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, and you know my weakness. It doesn't have to just be a drunkard. Just be a sinner. You're avoiding my question, continued the believer. Well, truthfully, I can't recall anyone ever explaining how to become a Christian. Picking up his Bible, the client read some passages showing all are under the condemnation of sin, but Christ came to save the lost by dying on the cross for their sins. By receiving him as your substitute and your redeemer, he said, you can be forgiven if you're willing to receive Jesus. Let's pray. He didn't give him an option. <laughs> the lawyer agreed, and when it was his turn to pray, he exclaimed, oh, listen to this. Man, I've heard prayers like this when I'm sitting down with people and they come to Christ. Oh, Jesus, I'm a slave to drink. One of your servants has shown me how to be saved. Oh, forgive me of my sins and help me overcome the power of this terrible habit in my life. Right then and there, he was converted. The lawyer's name was C.I. Schofield, who later edited the reference Bible that had his name on it. A modern-day Philip, who was obedient to answer questions, had a relationship with the Lord, prayed with unbelievers, brought a man on a desert road into the kingdom of God because he put his faith in action. One person. We have daily opportunities to see God opening doors for us. When will we quit stuttering and answer the questions?
Christian, who is it this morning that the Lord's putting on your mind? That you need to go talk to him. <coughs> Will you pray to the Lord that he'll use you to talk to him about Christ? You say, I have no strength, I'm afraid. Go to him. Let him give you the strength. Let him give you the words. Pray just like Schofield prayed. Whatever it is on your heart, tell him. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you heard something today. And you've heard something about him. But you're just really not sure. Maybe you have questions. Come and let us answer those questions for you. Or find somebody who will. Come because he's waiting on you. He wants to forgive your sin of unbelief. All you have to do is ask him for forgiveness. And all you have to do is repent. All you have to do is change your mind about who he is. That he's not just a mere mortal man, but he's the savior of the world. He's the God man who came and who died for you and was raised again. All you have to do is trust in him alone. Trust in his death, burial, and resurrection. To teach you how to walk in faith. And then let him transform your life. Maybe you've been visiting with us. And you want to be a part of this congregation. At Waxhaw Baptist Church. We'd love to have you. God's teaching us. And he's on a, we're on a wonderful journey together. But as Sandy and the musicians come. I ask that you would allow God's Holy Spirit to lead you to do whatever you need to do. You know what it is. You know what it is. Don't deny it. And you come and you do what you need to do as we have this time of hymn of invitation.